Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Uh, about a month or so ago, we put out a video on mil U.S. military carbine clones. Uh, and that was my carbine collection, and uh, you all seem to really like that one quite a bit. So uh, we figured we'd do another part to that, but this time it would be my service rifles. It would be based off of the U.S. government service rifle. The basic Colt 601 AR-15 to the XM-16E1 to the M16A1, to the M16, to the M16A4, and so on and so forth. So basically what we have here is my collection of rifles. Now, every rifle that you see here, not one of these is something you're going to be able to go and buy. These are all rifles that have been very meticulously put together, or very, very detail-oriented. Um, vast majority of these rifles are all Colt parts. They're all original Colt parts, uh, with the exception which we'll be going over. Now, when I did these, uh, these are very, very detail-oriented. Uh, these are years of searching out parts. And basically, I wanted to have the closest representations that I could get without having to go out and spend $60,000 or more for a, a real 601 or going out and spend over $30,000 plus for a pre-86. We're going to be going over these rifles, for, uh, starting with the, with the Model 601. Now, the Model 601 we have here uh, is is a very interesting rifle in the way that it was built. Now, the primary rifle came off of the BRN 601, uh, the original BRN 601 rifle that uh, Brownells put out. The initial rifles that Brownells put out were a black color. This was the updated gray color, so I was very happy to see that they did that. Now, for as far as the barrel is concerned, this is the original barrel that came with the uh, with the with the brown L. It's a faction type barrel, I believe, and the same duck bill that came with it, and the same front sight. The stock brown L's BR BRN six hundred one really there, there's nothing out there that even comes close to having uh, as authentic of a six hundred one as you can possibly have, but. Just me being as anal retentive as I am when it comes to details, uh, I took it a lot further. So we're just going to jump right into this one. Now the stocks you see on here, they are the original BRN601. However, as you can see, these have the exact precise color that you would have had on a 601. And I got to thank Jay, uh, out who works with Michiko. Uh, Jay was kind enough to do this for me. He found a method, and I believe you can find it on Michiko's website, where uh, he talks about the colors that he uses and whatnot to give you, to use the exact green that was used on the 601. Now, those of you who followed the brown owls, you originally had a mint green, the mint green no bueno. That, that was not going to work. Uh, that The original rifles had, they looked nothing like that. Then Brunel's corrected that with a olive drab type color. Now, the olive drab type color was a lot closer to the uh, original, but it still was, was not there. This green is the exact green that was placed over the Bakelite to give you that color. So we have the Brownells type where we have no trap door. We do have these slings wheel on here. Now the sling that I got here, this is a standard uh, M1 Garand or M14 type sling that was uh, got on Amazon. Now Amazon has got these in green, they got them in black. These are the best reproductions that you're going to find for the model 601 XM16E1 and really, really early M16A1s. So we do have the triangular charging handle on here. The bulk here that we have in this is an original Colt probably 1965-1966 smooth-sided chrome bolt carrier. That is as close as you can, that is, that is original. Now, for as far as ejection port cover, uh, this ejection port cover was Brownells. Brownells came out with their own version of the early type uh, ejection port dust cover. Now, when it came to the lower receivers where it really got, uh, where I really got uh, retentive with it was because I wanted to have the parts. So what I did was, for as far as the safety was concerned, this safety is an original Colt SP-1 circa 19, early 60s. What utilizes the dimple on here. Now that dimple was part of the manufacturing process of those early those early components. The same thing was done with the rear uh, take, rear takedown pin. These also had those same uh, type divots on the left hand side here. Again, that was part of the manufacturing process. The magazine release. The original ones had parallel lines, and so what I did was I contacted. John Thomas. Uh, John Thomas did. He does all these retro type. You know, he retro uh, rifle components, and he made that from scratch. He made uh, the proper uh, proper 601 type. So now what we're going to do is we're going to flip this rifle over. What I want you to take a look at here is the bolt catch. Now, the bolt catch on the original 601s did not have the little paddle on the bottom to engage it. So the original 601s, it was a bolt release. 
The only way to, to lock it to the rear was to have a magazine that was empty to lock it to the rear. You couldn't engage it. Uh, that was quickly changed on the XM-16E1. However, John Thomas, he manufactures uh, from scratch those original ones. He makes them and he modifies those. So we have the exact type magazine release. We have the exact, exact type uh, bolt release. And I have an original Colt type safety on here. The upper and lower receivers are Nodex spud forgings that are manufactured by Brownells. So overall, this is a very good rendition of the rifle. Now, some other parts that I did on the inside of this rifle to add to its authenticity would be the buffer. Now, as this came from Brownells, of course, it had a standard, it had a standard you know, mil spec type buffer. However, to get this thing to where it needed to be, we utilized the original Edgewater buffer assembly. Now, the Edgewater, you really want to call it a spring guide. It's not really a buffer. It doesn't have the sliding weights, which were required for to work with the ball propellant. Uh, but the way this rifle set up, the one change I modified, because I wanted this to be a shooter. I want to be able to shoot it. The bolt carrier, the original the original firing pin was an oversized firing pin. That is the one component that I did change out to a standard because I wanted to be able to use the rifle with modern ammunition and I have to worry about a uh, heavy firing pin. So I did change that out. The bolt is the original uh, chrome plated, so it's not really designed to work with modern ball propellants. Um, however, this rifle is not really used a lot. I use this more for what we're seeing here. We're, you know, show and tell is talking about the original rifles. But uh, I was very, very pleased with the way this rifle came out. I have to give Brownells kudos for everything that they've been doing with bringing back these retro models, including the steel magazine. The steel magazine was something that also that went away very, very quickly because of issues with malfunctions. But they even went as far as to recreate the steel magazines. So the Model 601 uh, that we have here is a really good rendition. It's as close as you're going to get. Now, for those of you who just want the basic rifle, certainly the BRN 601 is the way to go. Um, if you do want to go that much more closer, you can get a hold of John Thomas. And he'll be able to help you out with those fire control parts to get you that much closer. The next rifle that we're looking at here, of all the models of the M16 series rifle, this is my favorite one. This is the XM16E1. Although this particular rifle uh, had a lot of the issues that caused the malfunctions, uh, therefore it had the, the non-chrome plated barrel, it had the, uh, this rifle was set up for use with um, IMR propellant, not ball. Even though this was the problematic rifle, this was the quintessential rifle that went to Vietnam. This was the one that saw the Battle of Yadrang Valley. Um, this really is a classic rifle for me. Again, not the best of the series. Uh, the A1 certainly corrected a lot of its deficiencies, but it is truly my favorite. Uh, this one here also, this is mostly Colt. The only parts that you're going to see on here that are not are going to be the upper receiver and the lower receiver. That's it. So starting with the back, we have an original stock that would be from the uh, XM-16E1, I'd say probably around 1965, 66. Um, this, this is the original fiber right type. Uh, you get to have a cleaning kit so you did not have the trap door in the back. You had the swivel on the rear, again, the same as the 601. Now, this thing we have here is the same one we had in, the, in, the, in my 601 version that came out of Amazon. Uh, it is basically a reproduction of the M14 sling. This is the best option that you're going to have. Most of the slings you're going to find that are original, we're going to have some jungle rot on them. They're not going to be in that great a condition. To have a rifle this nice, I would like to have had a, a much nicer sling. The Amazon sling just took, uh, they took really good care of that. They're brand new condition and they're reproductions. The link for that is in the description box. So now we're going to take a look at the upper and lower receiver. Uh, these are both Nodex Spud. This was uh, bought from them. And the finish on here is the actual Colt XM gray that was done by U.S. Anodizing. The only company that I have yet to see who does a true authentic uh, color of the XM gray properly is U.S. Anodizing. Unfortunately, uh, the guys over there, Victor and so forth, they are primarily working with companies who do very, very large contracts. It's very, very difficult to get uh, them to do any of the receivers for you. Um, I was fortunate enough to get this while he was still doing a lot of them with uh, Nodex Spud. Now, he still does work with Nodex Spud. If you want this color, uh, although the Brownells are a lot less expensive, the ones that you go over to Nodex Spud, he's able to get these still done with a proper XM gray color. So I probably would send you over to uh, Nodex Spud if you wanted the true uh, Colt color. The pistol grip. An original model uh, XM16E1 pistol grip. This is the fiber right type pistol grip. The lower receiver, uh, as you can see, XM16E1. We have the partial fence. 
This was a requirement that came really, really quick because soldiers were going to be losing their front pivot pins in the fields in Vietnam. So they made this captive. Now notice this is not the full fence of the M16A1. This is the original uh, 601. Now one of the big things that made this different from the 601 was the forward assist. So this was the first rifle that the Army had, which they required a bolt closure device. Now we've had many discussions on my channel about how I feel about the forward assist. It was a mistake. Um, it was, there's no mechanical value to it. And, you know, we don't really want to argue with it. I will say that the people who like this war assist mostly are people who like it for press checks and so forth. They are great for as far as, uh, you know, your your doctrine for as far as making sure your rifle's loaded the way they, th they do things now. That is not a mechanical value. That is a training value. Uh, in all the rounds I've fired throughout my career, and you talk to anybody who's used this rifle a lot, they have never cleared a malfunction or got a gun back into service by using the forward assist. You do not ever force that round into the chamber. If you have, if your bolt's not closed, you get it out of there. You don't jam around there. You're just asking for more of a trouble, but that's a whole different, different, different topic. The rear sight on here, this was an original 1965 one also that came off of a, uh, an old National Guard rifle. Uh, to give to give it the original appearance as well, the charging handle. The charging handle was an original Colt that went to uh, Nodex Bud to have them refinish that as well. The latch also was given the uh, the gray color. Now the bolt carrier group on this one is a original XM16E1 again 1965 era. Uh, bolt carrier. Now this one has the heavy firing pin. As you may not be able to see, you'll see the larger head that's in there. This rifle is not a shooter. Uh, this rifle here is basically a museum piece for me. So I have all the original components in here. It'll it'll never be shot. We have the original machine pin. We have the uh, the MP acid uh, acid etched on the bolt. Um, this is all original. Now, for as far as the lower receiver is concerned, the buffer that's in here. This is also. This is also the Edgewater buffer. This is the way this rifle came. This is when this rifle was designed to work with IMR propellant, not the higher rate of fire of the of the ball propellant. Now, for as far as the safety on here, the selector is the more current, uh, where it has no dimple on it, but it is still the original uh, safety. Uh, that was just all refinished. Now, for as far as the smaller parts on here, if we look at the front and rear pins, we look at the uh, magazine release trigger guard, we look over to the left-hand side, we're going to see the bolt catch, the magazine release, the safety. All these parts were sent to John Thomas to have refinished in the gray finish so it would match the original finish. All parts, original Colt parts. Now we look into the barrel. This is an original uh, XM16E1 barrel. It's marked 12 on the bottom. This is the one that was not chrome-plated. This was the original barrel that caused the significant problems during the Vietnam War by having by having the pitting in the chamber, which caused the failures to extract, which many people were, uh, felt that that was due to lack of cleaning, which caused that failure. No, it was not. Once you had that uh, that pitting in that chamber, it doesn't matter how well you kept the gun clean, you were going to have the failures to extract, which is one of the big misnomers of, of the rifle's performance in the Vietnam War. Also, this has the original gas tube. This gas tube is the original one. Uh, there's a difference in the way the rifle, the gas tubes are bent, so you can tell a older one from a newer one. The original gas tubes were corroding, uh, and they were causing problems with uh, with malfunctions as well because of the corrosion that was happening to them. That part was changed out as well. The front sight base that you see on here, this is an original machine front sight base. It's not the cast that you see on the M16A1. You have the original three-prong uh, flash suppressor on here. Now, for as far as this rifle being a shooter, as I said, this is a museum piece. This is all original components to build the most accurate XM16E1 that I could possibly have. And again, this this literally is probably one of the favorite rifles that I have in my collection. I would love to have an original Colt, but again, you're looking at $30,000. But all the parts are original. Next rifle in the lineup would be the M16A1. The M16A1 had all the changes that were necessary to make the rifle work with ball propellant. Now, the ammunition was not modified around the rifle. The rifle was not modified around the ammunition, and it was also redesigned, for the most part, to work in that in jungle environment where you had the heat, the humidity, and so on and so forth. So it had all of the changes. Now, this rifle here is all Colt, all original, probably late 70s Colt components, with the exception of the lower receiver. The lower receiver I have on here was an 80% that I did, and I had had engraved with Colt's 
marks and these particular marks are the export marks where it says Colt M16A1. By looking at this rifle, you would think you had an original Colt M16A1. The only thing that's missing here is the auto sear. Uh, everything else on here is original. So what we're gonna do is we'll go over it. This is an original stock, and as we can see from the rear, we have trap door for the cleaning kit that was uh, introduced around 1969 or so during the Vietnam War. The upper receiver, uh, Colt Kaiser upper receiver, this was, uh, again, 19, I would say, the late 70s. Now, this rifle was refinished. Uh, the upper, well, upper receiver was refinished, and the lower receiver was finished. This was done by U.S. Anodizing. I was able to talk Victor into doing this one for me. Um, as you can see, this is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the upper was refinished, and again, the lower was finished. This is the exact colors of the, the M16A1. Lower receiver uh, components. The entire fire control group is all Colts. Uh, with the exception of the trigger being uh, semi-automatic only. We have the updated buffer in here. We have the standard manganese phosphate bolt carrier group in here, MPC marked uh, bolt, and we have, which has been shot peen to handle the, uh, the the higher rates of fire of the created by the ball propellant. We have standard A1 rear sight. Now, if we notice in the lower receiver, we have the full magazine fence, or we refer to as a BOSS. The whole purpose of this was with the rifle was to be dropped on a hard surface, you wouldn't disengage the magazine. Uh, and this, this rifle here would serve probably from 1969 right up through its replacement in 1985 in the U.S. Army with the M16A2, but they would be seen well into the 90s and well into the Gulf War I, uh, with, uh, the Air, especially with the Air Force and, then of course, the National Guard, uh, who were the last ones to get the you know, newer updated M16A2s. Handguards, original Colt, slip ring original Colt. Uh, we have the upgraded gas tube. Now the M16A1s did have a for a forged front sight base, which is what you see here. The barrel on here is marked CMPC Chrome Bore, uh, which is probably you know, the late 70s to early 80s is the way the Colts 1 12 inch barrels were marked. You had CMPC, CMPB, then CMP Chrome Bore, which is what this one was. You have the birdcage flash suppressor on here as well. So, uh, quintessential rifle, um, again, all Colt with the exception of the 80% lower receiver. Now, those of you who are in the Air Force, uh, this will look a little bit more familiar. Now, we have the M16A1 versus what we have here is the M16. Only one difference, lack of forward assist. The Air Force uh, was not interested in the forward assist. They knew that it wasn't needed, so they saw no reason to add it to their rifles. So the rifles that the Air Force bought uh, early in the Vietnam War did not have it. Now, these rifles here would be seen well into the 90s as well in the Air Force. In fact, what ended up happening with these rifles, uh, and even 601s, was these would be updated with conversion kits to turn these into M16A2s, which we'll talk a little bit more when we look into the, into the A2s. But the rifle we have here is the M16. It is the exact same as the A1 minus this. Now, there was one difference, and this was eventually changed as well. Now, when you take, care, take a look at the bolt carrier we have here, we have a manganese phosphate carrier, but you notice that there's no forward assist notches. Now, for the earlier part of the Vietnam War, right up through probably uh, the real early 70s, there was two different part numbers you had with and without forward assist notches. The Department of Defense decided that uh, this particular bolt carrier would not work in the A1, but the A1 would work in both. Uh, so... They, they stopped production of the bolt carrier without the forward assist notches in favor of just the, uh, the standard one with the forward assist, and all spare parts would go out that way. So you would see Air Force rifles with both of these, with both of these types of carriers. But other than that, it's the exact same. Now this, the components on here, the, the upper receiver is completely Colt. We have a barrel that's marked CMPC, which would be, uh, chrome chamber only. So this would be more of a transitional type barrel, uh, from, going from the standard barrels that were corroding in Vietnam to the chrome chamber only. This wasn't done very long. They eventually, uh, as soon as they got the process done, went to the full chrome bore and chamber. This one here still is an early rifle from the Vietnam era. So you had a machine front sight base instead of a forged. Now, many of the M16s you will see will have uh, the, the forged as well. So it would depend on when the rifle was, uh, was, was manufactured. The lower receiver on here is, uh, is PWA or PacWest Arms. This was Carl Lewis. Uh, Carl Lewis manufactured these in the late eighties. Uh, M16A1. He also made M16A2 type lower receivers. Now this lower receiver was refinished, uh, by a company in Connecticut, which is called Light Metals. Light Metals is a company that Colt had worked with 
for many, many years. And so far as I know, they may be still working with them on anodizing. Uh, back when this was done, they were still doing some of the Colt Gray. This is more of the later color. It was more of the, uh, of the matte black, but it still was, it would be accurate for uh, an M16A1 uh, during any part of the, you know, the, you know, its production. Earlier rifles, Colt XM Gray. And then as time went on, they would go and get a little bit darker. Uh, but the M16A1s were never what you would see, you know, today is the jet black. But all the components here are Colt, except for the lower receiver, uh, which is uh, which is manufactured by Pac West Arms, which was Carl Lewis. The next rifle we have here is the M16A2. Now this one was a lot more uh, sentimental to me, just to the fact this was this was my service rifle uh, in 1990-91 time period. Uh, 1985, it replaced the uh, M16A1 in the Army. 1983, it replaced the M16A1 in the Marine Corps, primarily a Marine Corps-driven rifle. Now, this rifle here is fairly stock. Um, this particular one was built off of a Colt Sporter Target uh, lower receiver uh, that had the auto sear block. It had the oversized hammer and trigger pins. This came with the standard barrel uh, that had no bayonet lug. Well, the first thing I did when I got this rifle was I contacted Kel Ken Elmore, Specialized Armor and Warehouse, and I got a proper U.S. government M16A2 barrel. So, just swapped out barrels. The, the other thing that was changed was, at the time this rifle was put out, this was when they were putting out the standard front pivot pin, but they had a screw and collet on the left-hand side. I didn't like that. You know, I wanted the same thing that I had, so I had taken this to a machinist in in, uh, in New York, uh, out in uh, Hemlock, and he had drilled the pilot hole in here so I could have the standard um, captive uh, front pivot pin. The other part that I had added to this was the forward assist. Now, if you look at the forward assist, you'll see that there is a flat on here. This was a very early forward assist that was uh, placed on early M16A1s. When the A2 came out, they had the reinforcement on the rear of the receiver. Uh, they had a hard time working uh, because it was oversized. So what Colt had to do was they had to, mach they had to machine off this flat, machine this flat, so it would be able to function. And, of course, this was replaced by the smaller forward assist, which has been universal since um, you know the really early days of the M16A2. So I added that to it just because it was uh, you know, the particular rifle that I had uh, back in the 90s early 1990-91 had this type of a forward assist, so I did particularly like that. But this is a basic stock Colt rifle with only those modifications that were made to it. Um, it's This is as close as you're going to get to an M16A2. Now, we talked a little bit earlier about the Air Force with the M16A1s, uh, even some of, the, some of the Army. What happened was there was a conversion process, or conversion kits that were purchased by the U.S. government. Most common was a company called Capco. And what they did was they took the rifle, uh, in fact, say the Air Force, for instance, that M16 that you just saw, or even a uh, Colt 601, they would replace the pistol grip with the, with, the, with the new one with the swell. They would replace the fire control group with a burst. Then what they would do is they would have stamps, metal stamps. They would stamp safe semi-auto burst onto the right side, and they would have a fish they would put over it so it would seal it up so it wouldn't corrode. And then they would, on the left side... You'll see from the photos also, where you would have safe semi-auto, they would cross out auto and type in burst. And depending on the rifle, for instance, if it was an M16, it would, it would, they would stamp A2 on there. If it was an A1, they would, they would cross out the 1 or the A1, and then they would stamp A2 on there. 601, it would be a full M16A2 on the top, so they would remark the receivers. The upper receiver would be replaced. Now, here's where it sort of got tricky. It was the entire upper receiver minus the bolt carrier group. So if you were to get one of those early M16s or a Colt 601, you would have an original chrome-plated smooth side bolt carrier group that would go in that rifle with the old bolt um, that would you'd not be able to utilize the forward assist. It was the same thing with the bolt carrier groups that had no forward assist, not just the manganese phosphate. They would be throwing those in there, and you wouldn't be able to utilize the forward assist at all either. But it was a standard Capco barrel. It was a regular old GI 1 and 7 uh, barrel. And these rifles would be used right up through, well, for, for the most part, right up and through the start of the, uh, the global war on terror uh, after 9-11. Uh, at that point, most of the units that were deploying would be utilizing new, newly produced M4s that would have replaced them. However, you still would see rear echelon units or non-combat elements that would have these modified rifles. Um, I can remember when I was in Afghanistan, I ran into some Air Force guys, and I took a look at what they had. And one of these guys even had a Model 601 
that was modified. And instead of using the stamps, a guy used like a scriber to, to, to do safe semi burst. And in fact, that rifle, when you pull the bolt back on it, you had to basically stand, you know, you had to stand on the front, the front sight base to pull the bolt back. The parts were so, were so messed up with it. But uh, many collectors you'll see you know, who are in the Air Force, you'll see will go out and they'll get those Capco kits and they'll even go as far as to, to make rifles with modified marks to look like the same thing that they had. But uh, that was one of the things that was done, mostly Air Force. I can remember um, uh, probably early 2000s helping out the guys at, in Wisconsin at the, air, at the air base out there at uh, Mitchell uh, Airfield doing conversions on a lot of their original 601s and their M16s uh, into uh, A2s. But fortunately for those guys, by the time they, were, they went to actually deploy, they were able to get brand new M4s. The last rifle that we have here would be the M16A4 rifle. Now, this rifle here is very, very highly modified. This particular rifle was built off of a Colt AR-15A4 lower receiver. Now, Colt introduced the AR-15A4 rifles as an M16A4 type rifle. Now, I want to say type rifle because it wasn't exact. The way the rifle was originally bought, it was just a lower receiver, and the upper receiver that I placed on here was an original Colt M16A4 upper receiver. And I'll tell you why. The AR-15A4s that came out, uh, they were not, for, for those of us who were purists, we wanted them to be exact, they, just, they weren't really. The rifles did not utilize extended feed ramps on the upper receiver and the uh, barrel extension. The rifles that Colt was putting out, the A4s, utilized M4 upper receivers with uh, feed ramped barrel extensions uh, on the barrels. Also, most of those barrels that were used on the Colt Air 15 A4s were basically M16 A2 barrels. They were not F mark front sight bases, so they were not the exact production parts. Yeah, you know, I spoke to Justin there, and he would say, you know, the whole point of the Air 15 A4 was not to be an exact M16 A4. M16 A4. The, it was to have some of the updates. Uh, with some of the more modern and to give you know, the customer what they wanted. Uh, so the original upper receivers were sort of a hybrid. Uh, they weren't exactly M16A4. And again, me being a purist, I had to have the exact um, M16A4 upper receiver, F mark front sight based, uh, CMP 1 slash 7 NATO I wanted on there. And this rifle here is set up uh, basically as the Marine Corps rifles were. You have the, the RAS um, M5 on here, the, the handguard. I mean, you can see we have the uh, Knight's rail plant panels on here as well. We have a, the, the broomstick handle pistol grip. Now, I did add the this Insight Tech light on here. This is the sling that would be utilized by the uh, Marine Corps as well. Now, the upper receiver, two other modifications that were made. First, I had a notched safety on here. The, the safeties that came with the well, pretty much all of Colt's rifles had no notch on there. It said safe and fire, but it didn't have uh, the notch on here. And, you know, I've talked to you guys about that. That was one of the things that I did when I was at Colt. Uh, I tried to convince those guys that everybody else has marks on the right side of their rifles. Why don't we? I put in two changing uh, engineering changing orders. Uh, one was to have the rifle stamped safe and fire on the right-hand side. The other one was to notch the um, the safety. Well, I got one out of two. They were able. They authorized the stamping of the receivers, but they would not make the modifications to the safety because they said since you could pull the safety out and reverse it, it wasn't necessary. Which you know, again, that was not really a good idea. But they did it anyways. I did have a UID label made. Um, I have Colt's cage code on here. I have the M16A4 part number and the actual serial number of this rifle. I have the Trigicon 420 ACOG on here, which was also the Marine Corps issue uh, scope the Matek backup site, and this is also the carrier that uh, the Marine Corps uses that has a magazine on the, on the right-hand side. We flip it over, you can see the, uh, the Matek site here. Now, I do want to say one more thing about the AR-15A4. The, AR, the AR-15A4 name did not come from Colt. I always believe in giving credit where credit is due. Um, when I was at Colt to run the 2009 time period, many of you know who Ken Elmore is, Ken Elmore Specialized Armament Warehouse. At that time, Ken was also a armor instructor for Colt. He had decided he really wanted to have uh, an M16A4 type rifle. So he got financing together to buy, I don't know how much, it was, it was well over 1,000 complete rifles and well over 500 additional upper receivers. And he presented Colt with the, with the bill of materials, and he gave them the AR-15A4 logo, exactly as you see it on here. And basically, the rifles would have been very simple to make. All it was was a standard lower receiver with the marking on there and a standard government upper receiver. That was it. And 
I remember my boss saying, no one's going to tell us how to market our rifles, and they told him no. So they turned away, I don't know, Ken had a couple million dollars that he had had investors uh, put into to build these rifles, The Colt refused to do it. But this exact artwork I saw on my boss's desk that Ken did in 2009. And then, of course, all these years later, now they come out with an AR-15, A4, same way, same way the markings were. So, but that's where that really, really came from. Now, another interesting thing about the M16A4s is Colt made very few of them for the U.S. military because uh, right after the rifle was adopted, FN got the contract for it. So those of you who are purists and you want to have the most accurate rendition of the M16A4, you say, well, should I buy the Colt AR-15A4 or should I go with the, uh, the FN Collector Series? Hands down, you need to go with a Colt. And this is the reason why. This rifle has all of the actual U.S. government markings on it. CMP 556801-7. CI on the, on the bolt carrier. MPC on the bolt. It has the all those actual numbers. It has the forging codes on there. The, you know, the C and so forth. When you buy the FN Collector Series, that is not the FN M16A2. That is a commercial version. They're not allowed by contract to give you those marks. So your barrel is not going to have the FN MP1 1 slash 7 8 0 5 5 6. It's not going to have that. You're not going to have the FN on the side of the carrier. You're not going to have the MPF on the on the bolt. They can't do that. So it's not going to, you're not going to have the exact markings on them as, as the military rifles. If you want all those markings, you have got to go with the Colt. And those of you who say you want an M16A4, you buy an AR 15A4. You may have to go shopping to find a bolt that says MPC or a carrier that has a C on it because they may come either way. You may be fortunate and have one that has an F mark front sight base. So you really want to take a look at the rifle before you do it. But this rifle here was hand put together. Um, certainly I could have started off with a complete AR 15A4 rifle. I didn't need to because I already had had the proper U.S. government issue uh, upper receiver assembly. But those of you who want to start off with a complete rifle, you may get lucky enough to have the F-Mark front sight base and you're good to go. And then, you know, you, you can build your exact clone. So there you have it, my U.S. Service Rifle Clone Collection. You're looking at going from 19, you know, the early 1960s right up and through current day. Now, the interesting thing about here is these are all U.S. service rifles. They served. Now, the 601 was not type classified as the M16. It was still a experimental rifle. XM16E1. At that time, it was still XM experimental, but it was utilized on, on great numbers. And then from the M16, M16A1, A2, and A4, you have the actual U.S. service rifles uh, type classified that any soldier who served in our, US, our military from 1960 through current days today, these are your service rifles. Unlike the carbines that I showed you when we went through the carbines, all those carbines up into the M4, those were all experimental. There were there was never a type classification. You had ones that were bought commercial off the shelf. You didn't have an actual U.S. government issue carbine until the M16, until the M4. And then of course you had the M4A1, you know, and so forth. But this represents the U.S. service rifles for the last 60 or so years. And the companies that you really need to take a look at. You want customized components for the earlier rifle ones, John Thomas. Uh, for as far as the lower receivers are concerned, uh, the Brace Man was the one who did most of them, but uh, unfortunately Colt uh, basically shut him down for as far as being able to do Colt markings because of trademark. So, but he can still do other ones like Divaco. He can do some, you know, FN. He's still doing FN. He's still doing some other ones as well. For as far as the finishing is concerned, that's the real hard one. It's uh, trying to get those original finishes. U.S. anodizing is the place to go to, but uh, I think you'd be really uh, hard bent to be able to have them do individual rifles. Those of you who want to build those rifles that have those original finishes, you're going to have to go with Nodex Spud for as far as to get the proper finish. Uh, the, the Brownells uh, series, you have the BRN-601, the BRN-16E1, you have the BRN-M16A1, you have basic rifles that are all these that uh, they're not 100% correct, but they're in the 90s. Uh, you'd be able to get those parts to modify them, or if you just want shooters. None of these guns here are really shooters. These are all more of my collection. I have other guns that I shoot. Uh, I just want these to be clone correct. So, I hope you all did enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.